thank you all for coming out to this session. I'm so excited. It was such an honor for me to be uh, invited to speak to Margot about this book on Michael Jackson. The title of the session is about Michael Jackson. And Margot is a Pulitzer Prize winning cultural critic, an award-winning memoirist, her memoir, Negro, Negro Land, a memoir. And uh, the book we're going to talk about today is on Michael Jackson. And Margot, you wrote this book in 2006. So that well, was, it was published, published in 2006. 2000. Actually, 2005 was the hardback. So I was really working on it in 2002 to 2004. And a lot of the time I was working on it, you know, the trial was going on. Though when I began it, None of that had happened yet. And the trial, which we will talk about, is the, is the last chapter in the book. Exactly. But obviously, since you wrote the book, Michael died. And I know that at that time, I, I heard you being interviewed and I read you know, some of what you wrote at, in the aftermath of, of his death. And you said, it was, I don't, I'll paraphrase and hopefully sure. I won't butcher it, but you said, <laughs> at least now we can get away from the circus and the freak show and, and remember the incredible music, the canon, the art that Michael Jackson created. Explain your thoughts. Uh, I think probably many of you remember that in the um, aftermath, the months and years that followed the trial, uh, you know, being found legally innocent is not the same thing in people's minds as being found um, innocent, as being exonerated. And um, I understand that. Um, but he was in many ways all but written out of or very much footnoted in um, the areas in which he had um, excelled, been a genius, been a master. Um, music, dance, um, video um, slash short films. Um, you know, and you would, you would note, you know, um, uh, articles, you know, about major pop stars of this or that period or about, you know, videos, dancers who had clearly learned everything from Michael Jackson and he simply wasn't being mentioned. Um, I think, uh, in a sense, he, to regain that kind of status, I think he probably virtually had to die. Um, I. I think also, were he still alive? I am now thinking, and I wonder what you think as a, as a journalist and editor. I think that the, um, you know, the, the Me Too movement, you know, our close examination of um, all kinds of charges of sexual abuse and of what we make of the good, often good to great art um, that some of people accused of and found guilty of sexual abuse. What we make of that, that is, that, is, that is with us now, in ourselves, in the culture, individually and collectively. And, you know, he would be absolutely being re-examined still in that way. As I think, you know, we're, you know, my view of that is um, particularly since he is dead, one can, but with the living ones too, we simply have to find ways to, um, make what we think of the art, to, to simultaneously hold in our minds what we think of the art and what we think of the actions, the behavior, and what actions need to be taken there. Um, but do I think it should close out the art? No. Well, I'm glad you brought up me too, because that was one of the areas I wanted to get into today, because that has all happened, of course, since you wrote the book. But just to put it in context, we assume everybody in the world knows who Michael Jackson is, because I think that's probably true. Probably true, yes. But you might not all be familiar with all the ins and outs. So when we're talking about the trial, this was, he was accused... As, as, yes, he was accused of child molestation. Um, and yeah, there were all those years of, um, you know, inviting many, many, many children um, to Neverland. There were admissions. He just thought of them as, as, as declarations, pronouncements um, on television that he had shared his bed um, with children. There was at least one case settled um, out of court. An accuser was um, given some money. Um, I will say, um, all I heard um, and all I've heard since 
essentially is rumor. I have heard some rumors that, well, yes, that boy's college education was paid for, that, but I've never been able to verify um, anything. Well, your book actually starts right from the beginning, and it takes us back to Gary and Deanna. Where yes, and which Michael. I wanted. You yes, know, I, and, and it puts so much in context then, because so much of the attention, I believe, on Michael Jackson was on the freakish elements, the plastic surgery, yes. what happened with his skin, the Neverland Ranch, the monkeys, all, all the all stuff of the, that yes, we're probably yes. all familiar with. But the, the roots of his family, he was one of eight siblings, grew up in a pretty hard scrabble neighborhood in Indiana Absolutely. in Gary. Working class blacks in Gary, Indiana. Yeah. With a very, I mean, you could almost say abusive father, certainly a very strict father who had his own musical ambitions that exactly. played out with the kids. Exactly. Uh, you know, this, this phrase that we use so breezily, um, the stage parent, the stage father or the stage mother. Um, you know, this, this figure can be a terrible, <laughs> terrible figure. Um, and, you know, from Hollywood in the teens and 20s to, um, our, to Britney Spears, for that matter, as well as Michael Jackson, um, accounts for many deeply um, maimed uh, people, basically. Um, and that was one of the reasons I was so interested in writing this book. Um, he was, um, I, I'm assuming, how many of you here are to some extent fans of Michael Jackson, the artist? Um, all right, then um, you know, I don't know to what extent you all go to the, the early material, but um, I, w I was there. I was like 20, 21 when the Jackson 5 burst on the scene, and he was uncanny as a performer. He wasn't just a charming child. Um, performer. He was a brilliant, fully realized um, soul and pop star. Um, his, you know, the father did shape those boys, this little Gary, he, he took them, he rehearsed them, he did have the, the professionalism, the skill, you know, to study the dance moves, the music moves they needed to get them on what's called the Chitlin circuit, the black rhythm and blues circuit. That meant he got to watch from the wings every night and to study um, performers like Jackie Wilson, James uh, Brown, um, Etta James. Uh, and his father got them to the great, great music machine um, of soul and pop, Motown. So, you know, he accomplished a great deal. Uh, I was in London um, because the book had been issued there when Joe Jackson, the father, died. Um, and a, a radio interviewer um, said to me, well, you know, would it, is it possible, you know, for someone who is, who so molds the careers, um, the persona of an artist, not to be something of a monster? And I said, yes, <laughs> it is possible. Strict, you know, you can be but a monster. I, and I was fighting against this long-standing myth, you know, of the great, director, choreographer, who somehow must, in some grandly theatrical way, be a sadist, be a working sadist, um, to get the, the best out of the children. Um, you see it in sports as well with these little prodigies. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a monstrous um, myth, um, which I would like to be relegated to, um, to stereotype. Um, all of the, you know, Michael became a superstar, um, Janet became a superstar. You know, all of the rest of them, you know, um, became pretty much has-beens and they're all pretty damaged. Well, in terms of the connection between the trial and what happened and, and his childhood, so many people talked about a stolen childhood, the fact that he never grew up. Even his voice as an adult man singing and speaking was always so incredibly childlike. It was yes. such a high whisper almost. Yes, and his that isn't, wasn't at every moment apparently his real voice. You can in some footage hear him speaking, you know, in a lower voice, like a, a tenor, you know. But you're right, he absolutely cleaved onto um, that almost falsetto. And then as the well then that um, fascination with the children as an adult, that was also part of this pattern or had been explained or contextualized that children, he could relate to children because he saw a purity with them. And he would, he would say that himself. You know, I trust children. They, they're the only 
people who don't want anything from you. Alas, that is not true necessarily, as I think we all know, but what the children want from you is often much more transparent and in that way can be trusted and what you get back, you know, is love, is faithfulness. Um, yeah, he often said that. I'm not comfortable um, with adults. My childhood was stolen from me. Um, I believe it. Um. <laughs> you actually write quite extensively about child stars, not just Michael Jackson. Absolutely. You quote Shirley Temple and some other child stars about the loss of childhood, but also the, the damage that's inflicted on them when they're made perform, when they're made please adults in, such, you know, in every aspect of their lives. And, and they are made to, even when they're performing children, um, they are still doing it according to adult scripts and adult narratives. Often in real life, they are the parent, the adult, and the family. They're earning the money. Um, and you know, they're the ones who have this responsibility for mom and dad being happy and comfortable on their shoulders. They have to go to the press conferences and mimic and parrot um, these words given them by adults. And in the case of Michael in particular, he was always, with that little piping tiny person, he was always performing adult emotions. Um, or teenage, certainly even as a little boy, teenage emotions. I want you back. Yes, I do now. You know, um, with all, you know, he took Smokey Robinson's sexy ballads. He did Sly Stone songs. He, you know, but he also inflected in his vocal style and with this little piping boy um, voice, he inflected all these songs, some of which had originally been written for adult groups with, um, you know, the, the mannerisms, the little woos, the sexy little twists and turns of adult soul singers. Well, take us back to the late 1960s when the Jackson 5 and Michael first uh, came into the public consciousness because you were you'd grown up in Chicago. I mean, yes. you were in your early twenties. So, what was the social context then around having black musicians being appreciated by white audiences well, as well? Well, that was interesting. Um, I'm sure many of you are Motown fans. Um, the Jacksons coming to Motown meant they were coming to um, basically the first. Um, black music company, um, black owned, black run, black stars, to entirely penetrate the white pop market. Um, you, may or may, you may or may not know that there were, and to some, sometimes there still are, depending on the award ceremony, um, segregated music categories. You know, the pop generally meant white, as later rock came to mean white. Um, R&B meant rhythm and blues. Um, soul obviously meant rhythm and blues. And um, you know, you might have a James Brown superstar in the soul community, but he was not, until much later in his career, hitting these better selling, better paying pop charts. Uh, Motown was doing this, and the Jacksons absolutely um, galvanize that. It's, it's not an accident that the myth is that Diana Ross discovered Michael. Actually, Gladys Knight discovered him, but Diana Ross was so much the emblem of Motown's, you know, creating a glamorous, almost Hollywood-like star for mass culture that for Michael to be her progeny seemed absolutely perfect. Um, they didn't just hit, keep hitting the top of the pop charts. They integrated um, and made their way into largely segregated mass culture mediums. Um, they had a cartoon, their own cartoon show, which was cute and all American. It wasn't like those, you know, um, f um, figures in uh, those animal figures, um, like the crows in old Disney films who talk, you know, in some sort of black dialect that's meant to be a joke, you know, with every syllable. No, they were really these cute, all-American boys. They weren't, again, magazines were segregated um, in many ways in the, well, still by the 50s and 60s, by which I mean, for example, in my house, yes, we had Life and Look. We also had Ebony and Jet. You never had Ebony and Jet 
in White Houses. You would sometimes see stories about certain black artists in these magazines, but they were always ones like Nat King Cole or Sammy Davis Jr., who again were, you know, had hit the big white time or were in, in movies. Um, so that the Jacksons made the covers of every teen magazine, uh, that they made the Ed Sullivan show and Ed brought them out afterwards and shook hands with them and talked to them. In an earlier era, um, mostly he didn't bring black performers on after they'd performed to shake their hands. Michael sang, as I'm sure some of you remember, he was invited onto the Oscars to sing Ben. So, you know, if we're, talk if we're talking about not only um, the exposure and money that a, that a performer gets in these larger, shall we say, venues, but the status, you know, these lar the, the, this was the center, these were the, the best neighborhoods, if you will, of um, American white-ruled pop culture. Much later, in the, um, you know, when he was a grown-up, um, in the MTV era, he would reenact that, um, that you know, um, move into white culture and the insistence of staying there and prevailing by, um, he was enraged one year when he, I forget which record it was, but he won the best R&B or soul and he felt he should have won the best pop. And, you know, he just fought MTV um, and made some threats. Um, I forget which threats. They, he wasn't going to let them show a very popular video until they started playing him regularly. And then they started playing other black performers. Not that often. You know, so he was always in that way a kind of, um, you know, a, it's some, a pioneer is a pious word, but, um, you know, the, they, the brothers were in that way in the vanguard, the Jackson Five, yeah, of the integration of, um, of white American pop culture modes. And yeah. did he see himself in that role? Did he see? Absolutely. Yeah. That was what the MTV um, um, furor, and um, he was extremely aware of um, his status. Think again of his... Um, bestowing the title, um, the king of pop, um, on himself. This is definitely, you know, kind of saying, okay, um, Elvis Presley, right, was the um, king of rock and roll, I'm the king of pop. He said pop, he didn't say soul or R&B. Um, and that's fair in terms of his music, but he was extremely aware of um, placing himself at, the, at, at a cultural center that was not rejecting. You know, yeah, always as an artist, you know, his work was filled, you know, with black tradition uh, that was not rejecting that. And, uh, you know, yes, I know many of us are thinking, oh, but my God, the white skin and whatever. But I am still, you know, talking about the work. Um, you know, he never stopped giving interviews to black magazines. He call, would call himself always a black man. Um, but he was extremely aware of having gone, as they say, in Star Trek, um, where no other black man had gone before, or a black woman, um, or a black transsexual figure, which is now how Michael is being read by many academic, um, particularly critics, where no one, none of them had gone before in terms, you know, he had absolute global power, you know, um, from Romania and Bulgaria to India to China. Um, I read recently that the Canton Symphony Orchestra is doing, they've got a whole orchestral piece based on Michael Jackson's compositions. And that's just one of a thousand. Things. Well, you mentioned his skin lightening, because that's yes. such a huge part of what then became something that overshadowed, I think, his yes. art. Well, you know, I think in, a, in America, um, you know, this, this whole, the whole racial history um, around um, you know, black skin and what color symbolizes darkness in terms of the, um, the treatment, mistreatment and oppression of black people. Um, within the black community, um, that has been translated into, um, you know, that, um, a form of um, 
you can call it a form of self-hatred um, that we call colorism, meaning that lighter skin colors are preferred, not everywhere or by everyone, but that is, is a problem. So for Michael Jackson, though it was proven after his death that he did have vitiligo, that skin disease by which, in which patches of your skin, if you are dark, become pale, and if you are pale, become dark, um, you know, nevertheless, the skin whitening was like a kind of horror story version of this ongoing narrative of you know, the meanings of dark skin and white skin and the relative privilege um, of, the, the definite privilege of white skin. But his became really ghoulish. It was not naturalistic, which now, you know, when you look back on it, is interesting. Nothing about him was, you know, he was not turning himself into a natural looking um, white man or white woman. It was something other entirely. But I do think that registered for black people and white people, and I think across the globe. You know, I, skin lighteners are very popular in Brazil. They're very popular in Japan. They're very popular in India. Um, you know, it really registered as a kind of, um, um, a sociological and psychological um, tradition, and you know, turned in and and con series of conflicts turned into a kind of visual nightmare. But it, wa it wasn't just the skin lightning, which, as you said, was proven to be that disease. Um, yes, like so a, yeah. But it, the plastic surgery as it well that totally yes, changed. Which his again that looked looked like a supernatural. Horror tale, you know the, uh, but uh, you know body di body dysmorphia of various sorts. You know the the face became this thing. Um, there is an artist, and I'm forgetting her name, Orlan, whose performance art consists of she's French of um, con having continued plastic surgeries on her face. Um, he did, um, but he also never fully admitted it, which I think was doubly upsetting um, to people. There is a way in which, um, if for example, well, there is a way in which you can try as a celebrity, as a famous person, to, to claim understanding and therefore a knowledge of, self-knowledge and mastery of everything from your mistakes to your transformations, to your contradictions. Um, Madonna has always been very good at that. I mean, she's always, it's always, yeah, of course I'm remaking myself, you know, yeah, of course I'm a bitch, you know, it's not a problem. Um, Prince has been very, um, well, I still talk of him in the present tense. No, Prince is dead. Prince was very good at that too. I'm shutting down, now I'm emerging, I'm offering cryptic, but you know, they can be read statements of the various moods and stages I'm in. Jackson, Michael Jackson tended, and you know that too has something to do with that lineage of the, the child. He tended to deny what seemed to be very visible to all of us. He said, oh, well, I've had a few surgeries, but Hollywood is full of them. Hollywood is, but they didn't look like his, you know? And I can't think of anyone who's, you know, features seem to be almost imploding. The nose seemed to be imploding. Um, you know, so that was, um, a, that was a problem too, this not finding a way to take ownership of his own complexities. No, so, of course, they got named by other people. And while all of that was going on, of course, he was still producing incredible music. Yes. And was there an awareness, do you think, on his part that somehow the other stuff was eclipsing the music? Or, or would the two seem to coexist, certainly? Um, he, was, uh, he had to be, he was aware in that he periodically did have to issue statements, you know, issue denials, whether it was about sex abuse or about um, plastic surgery, or whether it was a critique of the press. You know, some of his videos, leave me alone, leave me alone, or directly, um, you know, sent to, um, spewed at, um, in very clever forms, the press and the media. He would often denounce the media for turning him into a freak. Um, so yes, he was aware of it. His ways of countering it regularly were to keep making the music, to keep touring, to keep 
fighting to get to the top of the charts again and again and again. Now that he, you know, since he's died, do you think that the focus has shifted back onto the music? I mean, what do you see has happened in the intervening years? I think it shifted more onto the art, yeah. The music, the dance, the videos, um, absolutely. You, you know, you, one can't deny, once one, <laughs> Once someone who has been seen as a hero, a villain, and everything in between, or a rebel, a violator, all of this was what he was seen as. Once they are dead, um, we have license, in a sense, and liberty to, you know, to assess. That's what his, you know, we all can become historians, in a sense, um, and curators of our relationship to the work, um, you know, which I think was a great relief for many people. You know, you don't, the culture doesn't turn over, including, you know, mass culture is absolutely a culture of celebrity um, appearances and disappearances and of wild exaggerations. Um, you know, what's that line from an old 30s song, Hooray for Hollywood, where you're, you know, fabulous if you're only good or if you're even good, you know, that's, but, so how many, I think he was um, um, a genius as a performer, as a, you know, musical performer, as a dance performer, as um, a film performer, and he was involved in the creation. He was a collaborator often, not always the solo creator, but he was involved in the, he was a songwriter. He co-choreographed um, many of his moves, he had the ideas for the films, whom he, you know, he picked the directors, but the ideas were, you know, usually his. Um, so geniuses don't come along often. And, you know, also I'm, as a performer, um, how many great performers in any medium, um, movies, um, music, whatever, can, you know, who will last, who've lasted with you as long as you've lived, um, can you name? The list is fairly long given how many there <laughs> make their appearance. I mean, the list is fairly short. So, you know, that needs to be as, as they say, as Arthur Miller wrote so memorably in Death of a Salesman, attention must be paid to that, yeah. Well, in terms of attention being paid, we talked about now the Me Too movement and Time's Up. Having us re-examine so many stories from the recent past and, and what's happened now, do you think that what happened with Michael Jackson, that that will really have another spotlight shone on us? You mean now, that it, even with him dead? Yeah. I think very possibly. Um, I've heard... Um, Again, you know, allu allusions to um, not videos, but um, you know, interviews with this or that person, um, you know, who who knew something or another. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get more facts, but we will certainly get more. You know, it's it's a it's a both a, a it's a test case in a way for how we bring um, complex thinking, you know, with all its contradictions and, and unresolved but named conflicts to, um, you know, to these, these subjects. Now, you mentioned that there are some academics now that are seeing Michael Jackson, did you say, it in, as transsexual? As trans, well, uh, as, it, not necessarily literally, but as incorporating, you know, in the, in the male and female looks and that sort of um, almost sense of mutating and metamorphosis, metamorphosis between male and female types um, as, as a kind of aesthetic, transsexual or transgender, transgender, not transsexual, transgender aesthetic, um, which I think is very interesting. Um, and I, I like it. I think it's a, a you know, anything that can bring, you know, whether it's in literature or a film video or a song that brings interesting new layers of complexity to um, what we see in here, I like. And, you know, certainly there is a logic to it, you know, if you, if you study his performances, his appearances, his use of costume and gesture, even the voice we talked about. What do you see as the the legacy now of Michael Jackson, either in the music that we have or in the artists that are maybe crossing or have crossed some of those lines that Michael Jackson himself had well, first you breached? Um, you certain, first, you, you see a kind of increased virtuosity in terms of the relationship of music, the singing, you know, the, and dance. Um, someone like 
Beyonce is a very good example, you see increased um, narrative and visual, by which I mean the visuals can be fascinating without telling a traditional story, um, but uh, increased narrative and visual sophistication. Now, he's not in, in um, videos and short films and whatever. He's not alone in doing that. I would also say that Madonna contributed a lot to the evolution of, um, you know, uh, though I think he was a better singer than Madonna, but song, dance, and really sophisticated videos. But you see all of that. Um, I think you see a w more willingness to accept, well, you know, these, what we, these styles and modes that we call that's white, that's black, that we crudely call white and black, um, a kind of melange um, and, and variety of influences because that was true of him too. Um, you know, he was always, um, not only, as I've said, you know, incorporating, re-inhabiting um, black performance traditions, but, you know, Hollywood, MGM musicals, um, you know, various fine art illusions prior to ape shit, you know, <laughs> Beyonce's um, um, uh, and Jay-Z's um, video of being at the Louvre, you know, he was Con and mixing high art imagery and low art in that way. Um, you know, teen movies, if you look at thriller, it's teen movies, it's, black, it's old TV shows, it's um, horror narratives, there's Vincent Price, there, you know, th there's everything there. Um, you know, even since certain kind of 19th century Edgar Allan Poe thing going on. Um, so I think there is um, more acceptance of, um, particularly for a black performer, of that kind of cultural variety that need not in any way be designated, oh, that's so white, that's inauthentic. Um, you know, a, a, a new, a, a fresher way of seeing the v performative variety um, that can be your own authenticity and that should be. Well, we spoke earlier about the influence of his father in many ways you shaped the Jackson 5. Do you think Michael would have ended up as a musician without Joe Jackson's influence in that way? He was so incredibly talented, it's hard to imagine how that could be contained. Uh, um, that is a good point, we, but we would have to come up with a narrative of who could have discovered him. Now, if someone else, if some very smart. Um, let's say Joe Jackson had had a really good friend, um, and Joe Jackson was not a tyrant, someone he would played in a music group with, and he did have his own music group, who was canny and smart and good at training. You know, they were, I mean, I grew, when, I, when I grew up in Chicago, there were all kinds of really good black dance teachers who had been on the vaudeville circuit, who knew, you know, tap and ballroom dance. And let's say he could have found someone like that in Gary, or Joe Jackson would have taken them, you know, to Chicago for those kinds of lessons. Yes, you know, but there would have had to be that, there would have had to be that vehicle, that um, conduit for him. But yes, had his parents been willing to find the, you know, other people, to take that, and they, and they existed in the black community, absolutely. Well, it wasn't just Joe Jackson who was an influence. Catherine, his mother, was an influence in, in a very different way. And we can see that because you mentioned his relationship with Diana Ross, and he had very I, public relationships with older he, women. Yes, I think he, yes. Catherine was kinder, though, you know, this, this role, Joe Jackson was abusive to the children, emotionally and physically. And I think we all know more than we used to, since we're speaking of, of, contradictions and conflicts um, that need to be examined and named. Um, this, the role that the woman in a family where the husband, father is an abuser plays, um, she was the comforter, but she was also, I know she was frightened, I know she had no options, but she did end up also being an enabler. Um, she did have musical talent, um, she sang well. She had, which I find very charming, wanted to be a country and western singer. You know, um, she had a limp, you know, so that would have been a little difficult, but it was possible, there were, there were precedents. Um, so, you know, she did, in that way, um, you know, she did provide um, a kind of of musical lineage, and she did provide them with some kindness. That does matter. She also spurred a kind of ongoing 
I think, love of, as well as a need to cleave onto, um, both nurturing and aesthetically alluring female figures. Because Catherine was very pretty, actually. Yeah. But some of those other female figures were very high profile. Um, first, we start first with Diana Ross. Um, Elizabeth Taylor. Then there was a whole series of them. Elizabeth Taylor stayed very loyal, but there was also, there were brief flings, if you will, with, um, with um, Catherine Hepburn, who became a sort of grandmother, Liza Minnelli, John, Jane Fonda. Um, Jackie Onassis at one point. Was Jackie yes, Onassis Jackie like? Onassis edited his memoir, um, his book, yeah. That's right, and you know you can see with Eliz with Diana Ross, with Elizabeth Taylor, um, with Jackie O, you can see traces of their fashion influence in his clothes, in his hair. You can also see bits of Catherine, and um, you know we tend to laugh at Latoya, but she also was very pretty. You can see little bits of that too. And what was his relationship then with these women was it he was seeking maternal a maternal I think he was also seeking you know glamorous models he was seeking glamorous models of show business aesthetic and power and success these were mightily achieving women you know and so they they could they could bestow um um knowledge on him um you know, as well as, as well as a kind of nurturance and, you know, maybe a kind of relief, respite um, from all the um, um, almost unreal and unrelenting demands of um, performing black masculinity all the time, I would say. There were two other women in his life, his two wives, he was married twice to two women. Yes, he was. Um, there was, Le well, the, the Lisa Marie Presley, I'm sure everyone has there. To me, it was always fascinating. It was, you know, um, there is the king of pop who marries the king of rock and roll's um, daughter. Um, so it's like an alliance between two kingdoms, the new, the new power, the new imperial power um, makes you know, takes um, the hand of the daughter of the late imperial power. Um, so that, to me, was always extremely interesting. Um, Lisa Marie Presley never spoke ill of him, actually. Um, and she said, well, enough. Um, they, were, they were in love. Um, she said, then there was the other marriage, you know, Otter with Debbie Rowe, who was the cosmetic, who was the nurse of his cos cosmetic surgeon. Um, Debbie Rowe is the mother of Prince, the older Prince, and of Paris. And another woman, we do not know um, who she was, is the mother of Little Blanket, who is no longer little, and probably does not want to be called Blanket anymore. <laughs> well, just as we finish up, because we're going to be inviting uh, people to ask questions in a moment, What's your favorite Michael Jackson song? Oh, God. I know. I, like, what's your, every, who's your favorite every child? Every day, every day, I change. And it often has to do with um, what video I'm looking at. So it's um, a combination of the artistry. It's not just the music. It tends to be. Uh, well, you know, last week, I just got out one of those old CDs, the Jackson hits, you know. And I thought, oh, my God, I want you back. I love it so much. Stop the love you say maybe your own. Um, his little ballads when he was a young thing used to kind of knock me out, like never can say goodbye. But I do love that um, thriller period. Um, I love the, what was the record, the Quincy Jones one before Rock With You? That was, I love that. Um, I love also, the thing, uh, They Don't Care About Us with those, drum solos, um, you, you know, I, I really do vary. Um, there's also a late one he did. It's a very elaborate horror tale. It's not so, it's the whole film. It's not so much a piece of music called Ghosts. That's very, very fascinating. Um, all What's the your favorite? Oh, I was thinking about that actually before this, um, Beat It. I, you know, I thought I you love were gonna Beat say it. that. Yeah, yeah, with all, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. And it's, yes, yes, and it's, you know, it's street stuff, it's West Side Story doing street stuff, it's, it's really kind of everything. Yeah. And it seemed that Michael Jackson worked out, or was trying to work, it to work out so many of the issues we identified growing up uh, as a child star, everything that goes along with that, having an abusive father, 
through his art, and you can see all these different identities coming Absol out in all the different absolutely. records and the visuals that went with it. Yeah, very much. Um, again, collaborating, creating something new. That you know, that wonderful moment at the Motown Twenty Five when you know, Billy Jean, um, you know, with its strange mystery and oddness and discontent and advance and retreat, you know, and then this transcendent moonwalk that nevertheless is like going back into another, to a secret stratosphere. Um, but it, in the art, they, it all came together. They cohabited. He didn't have to do, um, you know, I actually like black and white, um, particularly when they add that aggressive, um, virtuosic dance he does at the very end on the car with its references to Black Panther. Hello, Black Panther. Michael Jackson is the predecessor of many, many things. Um, but he didn't have to do that to be bringing all of these narratives and influences um, into. It was in every single video, in every, um, all the choreographic styles that he learned from and appropriated bits from and then recombined. And in all the kinds of songs he sang, you know, he was a superb sentimental balladeer and he was really, really, um, you know, um, a, he could be a very rhythm driven, you know, hot singer. Well, you've written so much about race and racial identity in your memoir, Negro Land, and then as well in on Michael Jackson and the fact that he did cross over so many racial boundaries. But I know you know, we talked about with, the... With, at a cost. It, it's always, yeah, hard work, yeah. But, but we talked about, you know, what happened with the skin and uh, plastic surgery. How was he then considered at the end, you know, of his life, particularly by the black community, well, you know, given all of that? In, you know, there was a lot of criticism of him. Um, and I think a lot of people doubted that he actually had that disease. It was proven a lot. There was There were a lot of doubts um, and... Um, that he had the disease. Um, and there was a lot of criticism um, in those years of the, you know, the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s. There were um, it, respectful and admiring I'm remem interviews really in the later years. Um, I'm remembering a long one in Ebony magazine um, that you know, really, there were some attempts after the trial to um, you know, help uh, from black magazines and, and journalists and writers to try to constitute a kind of rehabilitation, at least to let us give you your hearing. You know, you are in a way, you, you are still one of, one of us, one of ours, and we know that there are ways in which there's a long history um, in, the, in the media, in the culture of a black man being turned into, you know, a kind of um, a object to punish, um, you know, and, and persecute. So there was that um, interesting, you know, um, kind of turnaround. And has all the drama dissipated? Because we did say now the focus seems to be more on his canon, on his work, on his artistry. There's still drama with the family. Oh I mean, of God. course, the siblings. The family drama well. absolutely never stops. It's, it's, you know, it's Lee. Well, you know, did Prince leave um, a will? No. What is the matter with these people? They're always legal battles um i mean there yeah. was a concern that Catherine and then there were custody battles yeah. you know the, the the Catherine jackson claimed that one of her caretakers who was related to one of the brothers was abusing her physically you know the spectacle of a woman in her 80s being abused by a you know this doesn't stop um not at all and this this it, it's not going to stop you know germaine just married i think a 19 year old model Janet, no. se Janet seems to have moved beyond it a little um, bit. I yes. mean, she had a very successful Janet solo is career. Back, is, is back on the boards again. You know, she's a pro. Um, she keeps working. And in that way, she, you know, she never had the crises in her life. There was, there was the wardrobe malfunction. But, you know, she's never had the kind of turmoil in crisis, um, you know, and scandal that he did. But, um, you know, she's had her ups and downs. She's like him. She gets, I, I keep working. You know, this is the most solid part of my identity. So, you know, I, I, will, I will keep that. Well, I think the world will continue to be endlessly fascinated by Michael Jackson. Certainly his music and his artistry will endure. I think without that, you know, we'd want to let it go. We'd want probably not to have to take in this combination of, of entertainment that we loved and 
you know, scandal and confusion that we never fully understood, but I think the art makes us want to keep engaging with it all. Yeah. Well, if people have questions, we do have opportunity now to do a Q&A. We've got a few hands here. We have microphones are coming around. I've got the first one back here. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the things as I listen to you speak was, is how often we would like to make things either or. Mm -hmm. Something has to be this or that. We don't want to heal the dualities and say something may be more, and I think that's in all of our lives. Yeah. And I think one of the things that might happen with Michael and all that took place and all that continue, it doesn't negate his mastery of, of performance and voice and his ability and where he has taken us musically to also have this other part of him, this small child that, that also reached out uh, inappropriately, if we want to use yeah, that possibly word. Possibly a, a, a predator. To, uh, and, yeah. Yes, all of those things, but we are so... As, as a world even, and even his ability to seem female and male and all. We yes. want to put people in little pockets and say, and well, we, if this happened, then this can't happen. Yes, or if this and, happened. And render an absolute fixed Exactly. Yeah. So he will be in some ways a model for what we are already having to deal with is that it's, and that doesn't mean that one negates the other. You have to deal with all the different pieces. You can't just put it away into some kind of a basket and say, all right, we'll close this one and we'll just, and you know. And this is the interpretation This is the real that. way, yep. right? Because it's all of the above for all of us. Oh yeah, we're going Some to of us are just not keep, very famous. Keep, keep struggling with this, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And yet we, we've seen that with Kevin Spacey. It was his art in many ways was sort of erased. You it's know, true. His, I, I wonder, you know, I have to, I have have to kind of, uh, not exactly laugh, but I, give, I have to give a slight bitter laugh at myself because so much, so many, we have our principles, we have our analysis, we th think of ourselves as sophisticated, but so many of the, oh, but the art is great, these, uh, but, oh, but he's a scum, I don't ever want to see him again, really comes down to our preferences for the artist. Um, I find that I, I think of Kevin Spacey as a very good actor, but he gave a series of performances, even in House of Cards, that for me, I would not argue with anyone about this, um, he's, they're very clever, they're very artful, but they're, they're greedy in some way. I think of him as a selfish actor um, and a manipulative actor. And that's, I'm not saying that that means, well, yeah, of course, I guess that shows you, you can see in his acting, that he was a predator. I don't mean that. I mean that I don't care as much as people who love him. But I know that that's completely hypocritical. And I, um, you know, I, then there's Louis C.K., you know, reappearing. Then the, so, you know, what, how also, though, there's a big question, how are they um, thinking of analyzing, um, negotiating their reappearances? Um, one could ask that of Michael Jackson. Um, you know, how did he, what was he, and there wasn't room in the Michael Jackson case for us to, there was no room for us to talk about, um, well, there is real damage here, and there may, and there could be some suspicious behavior, was it, you know, but what do you do with um, mental disease? How do you acknowledge it? Um, when does it need to be treated? When does it need to be punished? And I think there was a, a there was a lot, severe neurosis with Michael, absolutely. And probably an element of trauma. From yes. Everything he'd gone through. Yes, and trauma gets repeated usually. Yeah. Um, I have two, if you'll let me. First one, I've always wondered. I really Wait, believe I he oh, had. Where are you? He's right I, there. I believe he. Oh. I believe he really did have vitiligo. Yeah. It, it, apparently, the um, the autopsy proved it. Well, I I have a friend who has vitiligo, and I'm just looking at him. But my question is, why didn't he put dye on it? And why did he? You know, he could have chosen to stay. Uh, Black. Browner, absolutely, uh, and, and I, that was I, that was one of the, un, you know, that was one of the criticism of, of him that really there wasn't an answer to. Number two, do you think he had a particular special audience? I taught junior high school for a little period during the time of the moonwalk, and I had seventh grade girls who were total, they were white, totally in love with him, and the argument was he was so 
neither male nor female nor black nor white. He wasn't threatening to them. And I wonder what you think about that theory that, that he was so non that he, he was very uh, available to them, so to he speak. He was very, very attractive, um, at both as a member of the Jackson Five and older to young black girls. And I'm now finding you know, girls of every group when I talk to my students and their relationship or, or older. I don't, let's think of it in terms of um, maybe not he was so non, but he offered other, um, he offered possibilities and alternatives beyond that kind of binary of this is feminine behavior, this is masculine behavior. Um, he was alluring and erotic. He could certainly con con convey, certainly in the earlier videos, longing, desire. Um, that you know would make um, um, a young girl or you know or a young man um, feel excited and pleased, but there wasn't a kind of insistent, predictable um, um, view of dom of masculinity as a form of kind of we sneer, we pose, we dominate, and I think that was reassuring, but also deeply alluring um, and erotic to young girls. And again, he had a lot of, of real boy fans who were not, weren't all coming out as gay. So I think it was wonderfully alluring across, you know, many, many boundaries. Hi, Marco. Hi. Thank you. Um, I just, I wonder if you were able to identify any aspects of his life, um, I don't want to say that were normal because that's, that word is too charged. Um, how about that he was content with and not always trying to change or announce with kingship or just that, to seem kind of regular. From for what him. I could tell, you're really asking if there, you know, if there was some kind of measure of recognizable, easeful satisfaction. Um, from what I could tell, you know, though he was driven, like many artists, by a, a kind of perfectionist urge, um, he said, and I believe it and you could see, there was, um, you know, real excitement, pleasure, and joy in performing off times. Um, if you're a performer, that's a huge part of your life. You know, that's it's your love life, it's your identity. So there was that, I'm sure there were moments otherwise. Um, but, you know, I, I, no, I would say the happiest moments that I could identify would have come in, in the work and in possibly, you know, all the, everything that went into preparing for the work. Hi. Hi. This is not a question, but it's an observation. You talked about his worldwide influence, and I think, um, his influence in India has not been uh, properly appreciated. I was being, I, I was being yeah, and I think you're talking about that yesterday. Yeah. I wasn't talking. I was being talked yeah. to about it in a way that was fascinating. Well, yeah. I think he, his music videos absolutely changed the way choreography was done in Hindi cinema, that is so-called well, ba right. Bollywood this is cinema. absolutely huge, yeah. And yeah, and the way that men uh, danced on ah. camera. And um, that, that was an enormous influence starting in the 80s and in, into the 90s as the cinema itself changed. And I really, you see Michael Jackson just, and, and even what is now done, you know, in America in YMCA's as quote unquote Bollywood dance. I love it, oh, yeah, that's great, Is, yeah. is kind of a, a um, uh, how, what do you call it? It's a sort of pizza effect, you know? It's yeah. Michael Jackson coming back through India. Yes, and uh, coming and back And being through. performed on a lot of bodies, including a lot of white bodies. Yes, uh, yeah. and also on a lot of, I mean, that it links a little to the question this man here was asking, this different ways of males performing, presenting um, themselves. That's, that's really, really, really interesting. Um, you know, there, yeah, that's, yeah, okay, I like that. Um, it would be interesting to know more about other countries and cultures in which, I mean, there, there are imitations or appropriations of his videos um, in many places, but where else it's taken, really taken over and taken hold. Um, 
would be fascinating. I, I know North America best, so this is a revelation to me. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Um, look at your Question. microphone. Oh. Uh, excuse, excuse me, just a second. She had asked for... Oh, yeah, I can't, can't see with the lights. Sorry. This is a much less... Excuse me. <clears throat> this is a much less uh, broad-ranging question. I wanted your opinion on a, a, a dramatic representation of his early life, and it was a TV miniseries called The Jacksons and American Dream. And I was wondering, uh, based on your research and your knowledge, how accurate you felt that was. You know, I haven't seen it in a long time. As I remember, um, you know, as a, it was pretty much, pretty much had the conventions of, of the kind of biopic, meaning you do get the basic arc um, from obscurity and a certain kind of struggling and, you know, ambitions, you know, each character having certain needs and desires, to um, with some conflicts in the family um, and, and, you know, in the emerging career. And then the arc takes us to, um, you know, a certain, to fame um, and success. Um, what usually gets left out and what I seem to recall by the, you know, um, left out were some um, certain conflicts that are considered a little too um, unpleasant, a little too unresolvable in two hours. Um, problems, psychic complications that um, are unsettling, that can't, you know, that again, the, the, this, the mini series, I'm saying two hours, it was longer than that, can't fully resolve. And also, you know, these are a mini series or again, a biopic, um, you know, they are commercial entities, nothing is included that the producers feel, and again, that's conflicts, that's unresolved um, psychic difficulties, that's certain kinds of ugliness within the family or even in Motown, let's say, um, or Hollywood that you know just can't be explained away. Those aren't going to make it into a series that wants to make money um, and is linked to continued good sales. Um, you know, of the product, which is the Jacksons, which is Michael Jackson. Oh, I was um, just going to let you know, kind of um, piggybacking off of um, the, the gentleman's comment about uh, um, Michael Jackson's influence on India. Um, in, in South Korea, it's a huge influence on K-pop. And okay, okay. And just this year... Um, now, when you say a huge influence, um, can you be a little more specific? Because I just don't know much about K-pop except that it exists. Oh, yeah, sure. No, no, well, um, K-pop is, you know, like largely... I mean, is, is, uh, if you listen to the music, you'll, you'll hear a lot of influences. Um, but just this year... The, um, one of the largest labels, SM, uh, SM uh, Town or SM Glow, I can't remember, but uh, SM Entertainment, um, did an entire, uh, uh, like an evening celebration of the 30th anniversary of Man in the Mirror, um, like brought <sighs> Saida Garrett to perform with uh, one of the top oh um, K-pop okay. performers. Oh, whoa, okay. Yeah, yeah. So they, I mean, and Quincy Jones was in the audience and Cute. everything. Okay. Yeah, so it's on YouTube if you get a chance to watch it. I will I will make the chance to watch it. Yeah, yeah. it's it's great and it just shows they like they didn't I mean, you know, they didn't just like honor him by like paying homage to him in the music. I mean, they it, said we owe we owe this guy and we owe Saida Garrett. Right. So. Okay. So this is musical, gestural, performative. Every Thank you. Okay. We just have time for one more question. Um, my question is, what, was he a foodie? Did he like sports? Um, what was his favorite music? He claims to have loved virtually every kind of music, including classical. Um, he didn't eat very much. He was kind of a, na and he, he, all, he, there are accounts of his eating junk, but there are a lot of accounts of his, you know, eating very small bits of healthier food. I personally think, though I didn't say it, and some, some, a some couple of very close friends who are dancers or dance critics um, would look at him and say, mm, touch of anorexia, you know, in some of those. And I think that that, that was true. 
probably, yeah. Yeah. Did, did he like sports? He never said he did, but he loved physical, you know, any kind of physical virtuosity. Though, you know, he liked dance better. And there is that, of course, this was when Michael Jordan was super popular, but there is that fun video that he did with, um, um, it, ain't too, it ain't too much to jam with Michael Jordan, you know, where he kind of pretends to be um, a cool basketball player. So let's say he was aware um, of, you know, of all kinds of physical virtuosity and all kinds of culturally accessible um, modes and models. Yeah, thank you so much, thank Michael you. Jefferson. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all to the audience. Thanks for coming.